is a dark tale from the underworld. A hunt for a rare gemstone that can change colour in different lights. A gem that's only known to be found in one place on Earth. A gem called Sarite. We discovered Sarite 200 years ago, but only recently decided, hey, that's really good looking. It's not a stone, it's a gem. So when it comes to mining one of the rarest gems on Earth, how do they do it? Redditch, England. A rough diamond, if ever there was one. This place doesn't look much outside, but inside, it's an Aladdin's cave. Welcome to Gemporia, one of the world's largest retailers of gemstones. And owner Steve Bennett specialises in a gem unlike any found before. Sarite. Diamonds are rare, but for every 10,000 diamonds, there's only one Zarite stone. That's rare. Locked away in a high-security vault, Steve has row after row after row of precious stones, including the jewel in his crown, one of the largest Zarite stones ever found. This piece is very special. This is... Uh one of the two of the largest sarites that have ever been cut. She's weighing in at just over 60 carats, beautiful cushion cut, the stone itself. Eventually will sell for about half a million pounds. It's not just their colour changing powers that make these gems valuable. Gem quality sarite is only produced in one place on Earth. Milas, Turkey. A thousand metres above sea level. Hidden deep in the mountains lies a bauxite mine. Bauxite is just a kind of rock, but it's a pretty useful rock because most of the world's aluminium comes from it. So if you're holding a can of cola, chances are it came from bauxite. This mine sits on a bauxite vein that runs from Europe to Asia. It produces between 60 and 100,000 tonnes of aluminium ore each year. Most of that ore is just soft grey rock. But over millions of years, heat and pressure have converted minute amounts of ore into crystals of sarite. It's not worth building a sarite mine because there's just not enough of it. But you can piggyback another mine. While you're digging around for bauxite, you might as well look for some sarite too. Because they're so rare, Sarite gems can fetch tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars. For mine owner Murat Akgum, hunting the elusive sarite crystals is like searching for a glittering needle in a giant rock haystack. <coughs> they soon home in on a seam of bauxite, but finding the sarite crystals is a far taller order. So well, this is bauxite we're looking at, and uh, as you can see, you can see vertical lines and going lines, uh, parallel lines going through the bauxite. It's basically the seams uh, where uh, there may be crystals. They discover traces of sarite, and excavation begins. Every fragment could hold a stone worth thousands of dollars. So they use small metal bars to chip away the rock that holds the crystals. This one. It's all broken up. We actually found a large piece here, heavily included. It has imperfections inside. But we still be able to get a couple of stones from this one. The crystal vein runs dry, and the miners look deeper in the mountain but a wall of solid rock blocks their way. So they bring out this bad boy. One and a half metres of pneumatic drill punches 20 holes in the bauxite. But this is just the warm-up act. The stage is set for the explosives expert. He carefully positions sticks of dynamite in every hole. Dynamite is a godsend. Before dynamite, we were using plain old nitroglycerin, 
which is highly unstable and highly dangerous. Before that, miners would have to light a fire next to a rock to make it brittle and then chip away at it. It was backbreaking and slow. Once the dust has settled, the team move in to inspect the rock face. No sign of crystals, but they could be hidden behind the rubble. It's a job for this speedy digger. Before you can say Turkish delight, the load haul dump truck has cleared the pile. Mini loaders carry the rock out of the mine three tons at a time. To ensure no sarite is lost, sorters on the surface sift through every piece of bauxite. Anything that shows the slightest glimmer of a crystal is dropped into a tube for washing and closer inspection. While back in the mine, the treasure hunt continues. Nine out of ten times, an explosion fails to reveal any gems. But this one has hit the jackpot. We're in luck today because pieces like this don't come around easy. It's very thick. It's also somewhat clear as far as I can see here. It's a breathtaking find. There is no way of telling how much it will be worth, but I have a good idea that there may be several nice stones coming out of this. Back on the surface, the giant sarite rough is washed. Then Murat personally grades the find of the day. Oh, yes. It's a very nice piece. Well, the most important property of Zarite, what makes it so special, is the color change property. And natural light, it turns um, olive green, minty green, and beautiful greens. And under incandescent light, it can turn pink and red. There should be a 10 to 20 carat piece here, so it may be retailing at thirty, fifty thousand dollars Twenty-five thousand pounds from just one of the stones found today. That's a pretty good day's work. But at the moment, it's worth less than a tenth of that. Its final price depends on the skill of the cutter. Using a diamond-tipped saw, he slices the stone, removing inclusions that affect its clarity. Inclusions are little flaws that get trapped inside the gem as it forms. They can be stains from water, they can be tiny bubbles of air, or they can be little objects like wood or bugs. But Zarite, they're looking for a completely clear rock without any of these little imperfections. That means cutting away 98% of it. Once a basic profile is cut, a sander impregnated with diamond grit shapes the crystal. Then the lapidary adds angular facets to give the rock that distinctive gemstone look. And a high polish provides lustre and shine. It formed in the earth a hundred million years ago. But after hours of sweat, toil, dynamite and craftsmanship, the Sarite gemstone can finally be seen in all its brilliance. You gonna mug me? I might gotta mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veely now. Still to come. Crafting boots fit for a cowboy. And building a trash-eating knight of the road. How do they do it? Cowboys. A lasting symbol of American endurance. They're as tough as old boots and living proof that real men wear heels. So you might ask, why do cowboys want to wear high heels? It's not a fashion statement. The boots were designed to lock into the stirrup and keep you on your horse. The best cowboy boots call for skilled craftsmen, fine leather, and row upon row of wooden feet. How do they do it? San Angelo, Texas. There's a bootmaker in town. 
and it goes by the name of M.L. Lady. Producers of hand-tooled cowboy boots for four generations. You might think that cowboy boots are as American as apple pie and shooting things, but Attila the Hun and his warriors wore boots just like this one and a half thousand years ago. Morning, ma'am. Good morning. Welcome to ML Eddie's. Leddy's boots are made to measure and come in any imaginable leather. From classic cowhide to kangaroo, ostrich, hippo, and even elephant hide. Making boots out of hippo and kangaroo is quite weird, but it gets weirder. How about a pair of stingray skin boots? Stingray skin is so tough that samurai used it for body armor. The most expensive cowboy boots ever made cost $106,000. They were made from saltwater crocodile leather with gold fixings. I'm not sure John Wayne would approve. Whatever the leather, the first step is to cut the pieces needed for a pair of boots. Hydronic presses, called clickers, stamp the shapes from a hide with a series of metal dies. Leather is so tough it could wear down metal cutting tools, but ironically for the same reason, you can also use it to keep a cutthroat razor sharp. Seamstresses embroider custom designs in the leather uppers, then Ramiro sews them together. To hide the seam, he stitches inside out, then reverses the leather on a contraption called a turn jig. Cowboy boots are made to last. The pair worn by Clint Eastwood in Unforgiven was the same pair he wore 33 years earlier in Rawhide. Each boot is formed with a foot-shaped mould called a last, a term that dates back over a thousand years to the old English word for a footprint. These disembodied wooden feet line the walls like Pinocchio's worst nightmare. Thousands of lasts covering every size and shape of foot. To build a boot, they choose a last, then tack a tough leather insole to the bottom. This cushions the foot, but also adds durability. Once the excess leather has been cut away, the boot is ready for its overcoat. The leather uppers are pulled down and tacked in place before the last is clamped and the leather stapled to the insole. Then it's over to Joe Orozco. With 35 years on the job, Joe is one of the most experienced boot craftsmen in the world. Here in Ladies, I was like uh, 21 years old, already married, and I've been here ever since. First, they attach a strip of leather to each toe. The style and shape of the toe is down to the customer, and there's a lot to choose from. Square toes, pony toes, French toes, round toes. I can tell you all the names that we take forever. Joe shapes the toe with sandpaper, secures it with contact adhesive, then sends the boots for their soles. Talking about boots and soles, gunfighters who died violently in the Old West were said to have died with their boots on. They're buried in them too, and cemetery is known as Boot Hill. To fortify the sole, a metal shank is hammered into the arch of each boot. Before the leather sole is laid on top and shaped. The sole is then secured using bits of lemon wood. Using wooden pegs to hold the leather sole in place is smart, because wood can expand and contract with the leather if it gets wet or dries out. So you never have any gaps between the peg and the sole. With the sole secure, they attach a layered leather heel and a rubber base plate. Then grind the leather to a perfect taper. Finally, it's out with a wooden last. 
on with a layer of burnishing ink to protect the sole and heel. And the finished article is ready to ride off into the sunset. Britain is under attack. From filth. Around 30 million tonnes of rubbish is dropped in Britain every year. That's enough to bury Buckingham Palace. Enough refuse to swamp Lord's cricket ground. And by George, it just won't do. Summon the Grime Busters. This is a motorised army built to reclaim the streets. How do they do it? Scarab sweepers in Kent, England. The engine room of the war on grime. They build over 400 street sweeping machines here every year and export them to Europe and the Middle East, South America and Australia. The first mechanical street sweeper was designed in the 1840s in Manchester. At the time, it was the heart of the industrialised world and they were coming up with all sorts of good ideas. Modern assembly lines are a bit cleaner than Victorian Manchester. First, the workers fashion stainless steel panels into enormous funnel-shaped bins, called hoppers. Each hopper would hold seven tonnes of discarded beer cans, dirty diapers and other examples of British litter. To pick up all that muck, you need serious suck. That's produced by a massive 90 centimetre wide impeller, a kind of enclosed propeller, rotating at 2,000 RPM. That's really big. That's like the inside of a jet engine spinning round 2,000 times a minute. That's serious sucking power. And as Will Drummond points out, the force generated by the fan can pick up more than just dirt and dust. They're very capable of picking up bottles, bricks, um, I would say pretty much anything that you'll find lying about a road is litter. Apparently, a street sweeper in Wales sucked up a Yorkshire Terrier. Minutes later, the dog was shot alive out of the suction tube and presumably much cleaner. With the super suction system fitted, each hopper gets a spray job. Any colour you like, as long as it's white. Then it's time to customise the hopper's ride. Engineer Dan Capon pimps a truck chassis to transform it into a sweeper. It takes three days to install the electrics and customise the dashboard to control the various brushes, suckers and jets at the driver's disposal. Then it's time to bring in the bin. First, the production team attaches the back panel. Then mechanics Mark McCaffrey and Malcolm Chapman train the hopper into position. It's a delicate operation. But engineers like Ben Capon are careful to ensure every machine is perfect. Building the machine does take a bit of time. So, you know, when it's fully built, actually seeing the finished product, the finished design, leaving the door, you know, it's quite a buzz. You know, that's your own hard work. It's good. But it can't take on Britain's litter louts like this. It needs power. So there's a problem. To get the sucker to suck, you need the engine revs to be really high, but to drive along the road slowly, you need the revs to be low. The solution? Two engines. And for some reason, the engine that does the sucking is called a donkey engine. With a kick-ass donkey engine, it's got the power. With a six-metre cubic bin on the roof, it's got the capacity but it can't wage war on filth without an arsenal of weapons. First, adjustable brush arm assemblies are bolted into place. Driven by powerful hydraulic motors, these can be loaded with a variety of metal brushes that scrape dirt from the street. Next, what looks like a giant pipe cleaner is locked in place underneath. This polypropylene brush will rotate pushing rubbish towards the suction nozzle, ensuring nothing escapes. The clever part is it hinges in the middle to direct trash right or left, depending on which side of the road it's cleaning. The brushes can all change their downward pressure and speed to tackle different environments. 
and these brutal metal bristles can be swapped out for gentler nylon ones to suit soft surfaces like limestone. With a 25 centimetre diameter pipe plumbed into the hopper's fan unit, the super suction system is complete. But there's one more weapon in this grime-busting battle tank. Water. 11 high-pressure water jets at the front spray the streets below to blast away the dirt. All they need now is ammunition. So an 1,800-litre water tank is craned in behind the cab and bolted in position. This clean machine is ready for war. And so is Juan Almeida. Let's go out there, find some dirt. This dirt keeps me going. In one pass, the sweeper sprays down the tarmac, scrapes up the filth and sucks it into the hopper. It can do an eight-hour shift before needing to empty its giant bin and refill its tanks. Another blow in the never-ending battle to keep Britain tidy.